Thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out on a rainy night. I, I wouldn't come out on a rainy night to see me. So I don't have a choice. Wherever I go, there I am. Uh, I, I've, I've spoken, this is a, a full house and I really appreciate it. I've spoken to considerably less full houses uh, in my storied uh, career uh, when it was a little less uh, storied. Uh, I did a, a, a reading one, one afternoon on a Saturday afternoon in Laguna Beach, California, um, with a book about Laguna Beach, California. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to be there for two hours. Nobody came. At the end of the first hour, the store owner left <laughs> and, and asked me to lock up. <laughs> and being the Irish Catholic boy that I am, I stayed that extra hour and locked up and left another time. Uh, Laguna Beach seems to be unlucky to me. And you know, I was doing another signing in Laguna Beach uh, where nobody came except for one, toward the end of the endless two hours, uh, a very distinguished elderly lady uh, walked up and she um, looked at me, she looked at the book, she looked at the name tag, she looked at me, she looked at the book, she looked at the name tag. This went on for 35 minutes or so. And then she said, are you Don Winslow? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, may I ask you a question? I said, yes, please. Do you know where the ladies' room is? <laughs> I did. I did. I did sitting there for hours with nothing to do but, you know, read the signs. Maybe the worst, though, uh, was in, uh, on Sunset Strip in L.A. one night, uh, and uh, nobody came except uh, one very drunk man from Poland, nothing against Poles, but this happened, so these are the facts, who thought I was William Burroughs. <laughs> and he... He kept coming up to me and pawing at me, you know, uh, in that sort of drunken way and saying, Mr. Burroughs, I love you. So, Thank you, dude, but I'm, I'm not William Burroughs. I, you know, Mr. Burroughs, naked lunch, it meant so much to me. And I said, yeah, I, me too, but I, I, I'm not William Burroughs. And this went on, said, Mr. Burroughs, I, I love you. My girlfriend loves you. And I said, dude, I don't know how to tell you this. William Burroughs is dead. <laughs> Mr. Burroughs, finally, I said, did you drive here? You know, are you in a car? He said, no. I said, I'll make you a deal. Uh, we'll have the owner call a taxi. And when you get in the back seat of the taxi, you're right. I'm William Burroughs. So I got the owner to give me a paperback copy of Naked Lunch. We got him in a taxi. I signed William Burroughs. <laughs> Please don't tell anyone I'm alive. And off he went. So tonight's a pleasure, you know. <laughs> uh, I've also been at, hey, can you tell I'm putting off talking about the book? How am I doing? Because he really said everything. Uh, you know, I don't have anything left to say. Uh, another night, um, they had the wrong Don Winslow. Do you know about the other Don Winslow? Well, neither did I until one night in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I was still at that time, I, my first seven books, I, I published seven books before I could quit my day job, which at the time was a private investigator. And uh, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and I have a free night. And what I do on free nights is this. I go to bookstores. My, my wife sort of, I think, uncharitably refers to this as dweebs night out. You know, I, that's what I do. I go to bookstores. And one night in San Antonio, Texas, uh, where I'll be in a couple of weeks, I was in a bookstore and I'm prowling through the fiction shelves like this. You know how you all do. You're all book people. You wouldn't be here. You know how this works. You walk through bookstores with your head crooked so you can read the titles on the spine, right? That's why we all have problems in chiropractors because we, well, this is a woman doing it right now over there. She's got her head crooked like that. And I've got my head crooked like that. And I'm going down the shelves and I see a book, Ironwood 4 by Don Winslow. You know, you know, I'm Don Winslow. And I don't remember writing Ironwood 1, 2, or 3. Never mind, 4. And I, I pick this book up 
off the shelves because I'm deeply concerned, you know, that there's been a memory lapse or, you know, a head injury or something. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's erotica. <laughs> and it's not only erotica, it's S&M erotica. There is, is not a single act of love committed in this book <laughs> without whips and ropes and pulleys. It's sort of Aeneas Neen meets Patrick O'Brien kind of a setup. And I'm, I'm embarrassed, you know, uh, and I turn beet red and I think, yeah, I need to show this to my, my publisher and, and to my agent. But I don't want to go up to the counter with the book. <laughs> and, and then I think, well, the only thing more embarrassing than, than going up to the cashier with a sleazy porn book is to get caught stealing <laughs> a sleazy porn book, right? So I came up with a genius plan. I bought a John Updike novel, so I look, you know, literary, and book of African history, it's what I majored in in college, which is what made me a hardcore unemployable. <laughs> the Bible, I bought one of those. <laughs> and I go up to the counter and there are three cashiers. Uh, one of them is a sort of middle-aged, kind of sleazy looking guy. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> Another one was a rather strict, sort of librarian-type looking woman. And the other one was a, looked to be about 16 or 17-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Texas girl with a crucifix. She's the one I got. Um, so I go up, and, you know, she scans the updike and the African history and, and uh, the Bible, and, and then she gets to Ironwood 4, the continuing story of a British private school for girls. <laughs> and she turns about as red as I do, and her, you know, big, innocent, sweet blue eyes get very big and teary. My little brown rodent eyes get <laughs> narrower and teary, and uh, all I want, all I want in the world is out of there. Just, just please let me finish this transaction. I just want to get out of there. So I took my American Express card and laid it there. I'll wait for you. <laughs> Don Winslow. The name, Don Winslow and the name. There we go. <laughs> it's Friday night. No, I get it. It's Friday night and it's raining and you know, this was like Wednesday night, you'd have been right there. I know, I know, I understand. Uh, and so uh, now we're both really upset. She's looking at the sleazy porn book. She's looking at me. She's looking at the credit card. It was, it was a nightmare. So um, I'm hopping up and down like Rumpelstiltskin on crack, pointing to the crime section. You know, I'm not this Don Winslow. I'm that Don Winslow. I'm not, you know. it didn't go well. So it's nice to see you all tonight. <laughs> Managed to go, what, 10, 12 minutes without talking about the book. I will talk about the book. I promise I will. I know that's why you came, and I'm not just going to tell jokes all evening. We'll, it'll get serious and grim and ugly and, you know, everything we like on a rainy Friday night. But it, I'm just putting it off as long as I can because I've been talking about the book now for weeks. And the publisher's not here, you know, <laughs> which is stupid of them to, to leave a writer alone is a bad idea. We're lucky I'm here. I, I came down from Philadelphia this morning. Uh, I got on the wrong train, but it was coming to Washington. But so I got here eventually. So here we are. So the book is called The Border. Brad's right to that extent. Uh, it is the third in a trilogy that I started, uh, which seems, I'm just intrigued by peeling this tape off the lectern. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Little, right, should we find out? Uh, I started back in 1998, which feels impossible to me. Uh, and uh, I never intended to write a trilogy. Uh, I wrote a book called The Power of the Dog, which is in the first of these series. We meet this, this guy, Art Keller, when he's a young, idealistic DEA agent in Mexico. Uh, and uh, when I was done with that book, I thought, that's, that's it. I'm done. I'm never returning to this topic again. Uh, I held that stance for a good three years, I think. And then stuff started happening in Mexico, you know, um, 
it, it, it approached a level of violence and, and sadism that none of us had pictured in our worst nightmares. None of us, but I mean, the people who watch this scene, you know, who follow this. Uh, and I, I felt that I was sitting on the sidelines, which is maybe where I shouldn't be, and decided to write a book called The Cartel. Uh, and after The Cartel, I also swore that I, bless you, that I wasn't going to come back to this world. Uh, swore to my wife, to myself, my agent would call up, ask me if I was going to do a third, I'd hang up on him or pretend to be a pizza parlor. I'd just say, 40 minutes, you know, hang up. Because no matter what you order from a pizza parlor, it's 40 minutes. Did you notice that? It can be cheese, 40 minutes. Smoked pheasant under glass pizza, 40 minutes. That's it. It's just 40 minutes, whatever it is. So anyway, uh, but uh, again, things started happening. After I finished the cartel, I really did think the story was over. Uh, both on a personal level with sort of the characters in this book, but also on a, a political level. Uh, I really thought that the end of the drug wars had come in Mexico. Uh, I was, you know, stupidly wrong about that. But I, in the trilogy, to end the trilogy, and this really is it, this is it, I'm done now. Uh, I, I wanted to bring it home. I think on a on a literary level, if we want to get intellectual here for a moment, I think that the, the ends of trilogies do come home. But also on a, a realistic level, a political level, I, I've been saying for years in public, in, in here at this microphone actually, that the, the, Mexic, the so-called Mexican drug problem is of course not the Mexican drug problem, it's the American drug problem. And yet I realized that I'd set probably three quarters of my books in Mexico or in Central America and I decided to bring it home. So there's more in this book that takes place in the United States than takes place on the other side of the border. And I also was looking at headlines and, and, and headlines that have sort of become labels. Do you know what I mean by this? Um, the heroin epidemic. It has become a label. It's become shorthand. And I think that one thing that a, that a novelist can do is to show a, a label on an individual level that we can get close to characters. We're, we're allowed to create and make up their thoughts and their feelings and their experiences as long as we keep it realistic, you know? Um, and rather than talk about the heroin epidemic, this book follows the life of a young woman heroin addict and explores the whys and wherefores and hows and what happens to her and why. Uh, we talk about the immigration problem. You know, I finished this book months before the caravans started to come up from Central America. But uh, the book follows the experience of a 10-year-old boy uh, forced to leave Guatemala uh, by the gangs. You know, say, join us or we'll kill you. We'll kill your mother also, which is, I'm sorry, a, a realistic situation. And he makes his way up through Mech, this incredibly dangerous journey up through Mexico to the American border, and it follows him past that through a detention. So I don't want to give away too much, you know, because I hope you read the book and experience it as it happens. But again, what I was trying to do was to get under the headline, under the label, and the technique that I choose, it's not the only one, but it's mine, um, is to bring the reader in and see it through the character's eyes, you know, in, in, usually in the present tense voice. Uh, a lot of things, of course, have happened politically in the last two years. And, and I write about our times. I write about my time. So it would be foolish and I think cowardly to pretend that the president was, I don't know, you know, FDR or Grover Cleveland or, or somebody else. Uh, I keep it realistic. Uh, you know, there's some people that are a little angry about that. Uh, usually by this time, by the way, they've walked out. <laughs> I've had several staged walkouts. So if you, if you are going to walk out this evening on a staged walkout, this would be the good time to do it. <laughs> I'll take a little pause. I'll tell another joke or a story or something, and you can walk out and demand your money back loudly in the back. This has become kind of a standard of these evenings. Um, so I write about politics, and I write about money, and, and, and one of the things that, that, that I think we all need to know 
is that we Americans make up 5% of the world's population. Uh, we use 80%, that's eight zero percent of the world's opioids. Now, you, that can't all be bad backs, right? And in doing that and in buying coke, cocaine, and buying methamphetamine, we send $65 billion a year to violent sociopaths in Mexico and Central America who have caused roughly 200,000 violent deaths, who have destabilized the society, corrupted the government, the police, and the military. And then, on top of that, we point our fingers from north to south across that border and complain about criminals coming up. When we send $65 billion a year that fuel, fund, and arm the Mexican cartels. So I got to tell you, and again, it's a good time to walk out, that if I were on the opposite side of that proposed wall looking north, I think about building the damn wall to keep American money and American guns out of my country. And, and I would hazard to say that if another country did that to us, sent $65 billion a year to fund what are basically terrorists who commit mass murders and violent crimes in our country, the tanks would be rolling. So there's a level of hypocrisy. And the other thing I'm going to say now that I've gotten serious and preachy, but then I'm going to open it up to questions is this. You know, the Mexican cartels could send cocaine to Florida until it tipped in the ocean. They could send heroin to New York City until it sank into the Hudson. It wouldn't make a difference if we didn't want it. If we didn't use it. If we didn't pay for it. All it is is powder. It's an alkaloid. Valueless. Except we pay big, big money for it. It's our problem. Opioids are always a response to pain. That's what they're for. And thank God, by the way, you know, for if you hear, you know, been seriously injured, been in agony, have a terminal illness. Thank God we have these drugs. You know, heroin comes from the German word for hero. It was made by the same people who make bare aspirin to, to, to um, cure the agony of wounded soldiers. Thank God for these drugs. But it is always a response to pain. Now, sometimes addicts start with a physical injury and they get physically addicted to that opioid. And it goes on for other reasons, but that's not the majority of cases anymore. And what we're not asking ourselves, I think, you know, when we, you'll never get the right answer unless you ask the right question. And the question that we as a society are not asking ourselves is, what's the pain? What hurts so bad? that we demand these drugs and that we're killing ourselves with them. More Americans died of opioid overdoses last year than were killed in car accidents or through gun violence. What's the pain? Anyway, I got very serious and preachy. You know, really, I, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm, I'm not a preacher. Uh, I'm certainly not a philosopher. I'm a crime writer. That, that's where I live. That's what I love to do. All I ever wanted to do in this world was write good crime stories, you know, and I hope I have. Uh, so I hope the book's a good crime story, you know, with good gritty characters and action and suspense and jeopardy and all that kind of stuff. At the same time, I do hope that, that a reader who gets all that stuff might also get as a bonus maybe a little understanding or a little perspective into the, the human side of some of these issues. So I'm going to shut up now and, and throw it open to questions. And I hope there are some, and you hope there are some, because if there aren't some, I will keep talking until he comes and says it's over. Uh, yes, I think there are microphones back. Or just shout.
it's not it's not for you to sit by it's because we're oh, okay. Right there. oh okay to walk, walk over wow. to yeah. Yeah. yeah right there or right here well, uh, there's I, someone here before you and then we'll get oh, to you. Oh, oh, no, no, yeah, go ahead, sir. So, uh, first of all, thanks for raising the issue about opioids and how it's mishandled. We're missing because I've, I've written about that for in my book, Mental Health Inc., and also for Newsweek and HuffPost. So you're right on point. What I wanted to ask you about your journalism is uh, not your journalism, your novel, which is so fact based. And you've done interviews where you've explained how you have done interviews with people both in the police world and in the cartel world to build these masterpieces that can't be overpraised, in my view. Uh, I want to understand, when you're finishing your research, how, what's the alchemy involved in transforming and not getting drowned by the real news that's out there yeah. about, let's say, El Chapo and all your interviews, and turn them into the compelling narrative fiction with characters that may be affected by news mm -hmm. events, but are not one-on-one -on -one Romana Clay. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the praise and thank you for the great question. Yeah, you know, I struggle with that because uh, my, my academic training is a historian. And, and so I always think I have to tell every detail in the correct chronological order that it occurred because that's history. Uh, I write first drafts very, very fast. This, I, I am answering your question, trust me. Uh, I, I, I write like I'm going to get caught. Do you know what I mean? Like they're going to say, oh, you're not really a writer and you know, handcuff me and haul me away from the keyboard, which some people have suggested recently uh, would be the thing to do. But I write, I only care about myself when I'm writing the early drafts. In the later drafts, though, sir, that's when I start caring about the reader. And I go back, and then, then I start to realize, you know what? You're writing a novel, Winslow. You don't have to stick to the exact chronology. You, you don't have to you know, make it the exact clothing that that guy actually wears. You can create more fictional characters and just take inspiration from some of the real people and some of the real events. So as drafts go on, I'm just more and more aware of that aspect and more and more aware of the reader and creating a good novelistic experience for the reader. But sometimes I have to sit back and say, you don't have to be the smartest boy in class. You know, just because you know it doesn't mean you have to say it. Does that answer the question you asked me? Yes. Sorry, I just need to make a quick announcement. Um, there's a white Volvo parked in the parking lot that is blocking quite a few people from being able to get out. And there are people that have been waiting for about half an hour trying to get out. So if you have a white Volvo parked in a weird spot, if you could please move it. Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my question is about the, uh, some of the allegations in the uh, El Chapo trial. I want yeah. your take... Uh, do you, uh, specifically about the bribes uh, that, that Cifuentes and others alleged about um, the Mexican presidents. Do you, I, I was curious about all, 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 you know, Calderon, Pieto, and Amlo, but especially uh, Pieto, do you believe that, that he actually sought out the bribe? And, uh, or also, do you believe the other numbers and stuff? Uh, do you all know what he's referring to in, in, the, in the trial of Chapo Guzman? And I... I, I resist that nickname okay uh because it's a cutesy sort of disney-esque description of a mass murderer and child molester and rapist you know he's not sneezy or doc or you know he's, he's a yeah. thug uh there were allegations from some of of guzman's former associates and partners that in some cases, $100 million in bribes are delivered to President Nieto, and I think $6 million to the current president. And uh, when these were pictured as, as revelations, they were not revelatory to those of us who've been around this beat for a while. We've been hearing these stories for years and years. Do I give them credence? I don't know if I can stand here and definitively say to you, yes, Nieto took bribes. I can stand here and definitively say to you that certainly people in his administration did. Whether that reached the very highest level, I'm not competent to say. Okay. Okay. But do you, do, you, do you feel like Amlo, Calderon, and Nieto were all kind of equally uh, equally on the take? No. For lack of a better word? No. Mm -hmm. No. Who was, who was worst? 
I, I, I would say if you look at the facts, I would say you'd look at the NATO administration. But the Calderon administration was certainly uh, didn't come out of it with clean hands. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now people from the Nieto and Calderon administrations will now come to the microphone. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Hey, Don, it's uh, hey. good to see you again. I nice was to see I you. was here for the force talk, oh, so it's yeah, excited to read the border. But um, so I saw your comments around the cartel, and you had some very interesting and moving <laughs> thoughts on um, or explanation for the dedication to that book. And uh, about the women and, and journalists, and I was wondering if there there's a rather lengthy dedication for the border, and I was wondering if you yeah, could share some thoughts on, on yeah, those thank individuals. You. you know, that's funny. You're the first person to have asked me that question. <laughs> uh, the if, if you look at the dedication page to this book, the border, there are 43 names that begin it. These were 43 Mexican university students who were slaughtered on three buses uh, one night uh, outside of Iwala, Mexico. Uh, the, um, the mayor of the town ordered the execution. Uh, the police and cartel people carried it out uh, because they were using these buses, the cartels were using these buses to move heroin out of Guerrero, the state of Guerrero up to where it could be processed. Uh, these kids from this university had almost a tradition. They were, they were going to Mexico City on a protest. It was almost a party. They had kind of a tradition of hijacking buses at the local bus station. They would go on and take over the bus. The bus driver would drive them to Mexico City. They'd do their protest. They'd buy the bus driver dinner and breakfast or whatever on the way back and deliver the buses back. So was it illegal, of course, on a technical level, but it had been going on for years. This particular night, uh, these kids got unlucky and um, were gunned down. Some of them were gunned down. Others were delivered to two police stations who refused to take them. Uh, the cartel people then took them out to a garbage dump and executed them there. Aren't you glad you asked? The, the, the second um, dedication is to a Mexican journalist, a, a Sinaloan journalist, very famous guy, um, who was murdered telling this story. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Hi, yes. Hi. It's, it's great to see you tonight. Uh, I really enjoy your work like many people here. Thank it's you. compelling and, and also horrifying. And I guess the the, the when I read your books, uh, I'm always looking for the way out. I'm looking for, you, you know, both. From, <laughs> from your experience, you know, get, yeah. what do you think, if, you know, the U.S., for example, should be doing differently? I could pick up in your in your remarks a few threads there, but if you could just flesh that out a little bit. Thank yeah, you. sure. It, it, and, and stop me. You know what I mean? I get a little crazy on this topic. So I, I will try to give you the briefest comprehensive answer. Look, I, uh, people always say this is radical. I believe we should legalize all drugs. Uh, and then when people say, well, that's radical, I say, well, yeah, I think it's radical to have 2.2 million people in prison. I think it's radical to spend $88 billion a year on drug interdiction that doesn't work. I think it's radical to have done the same thing for 50 years to get things worse than they ever were. And this is, means no disrespect to the people who fight that war. I have a lot of respect for DEA people and prosecutors and cops, and all these people are out there trying to do it. My point is, it hasn't worked for 50 years. We need to do something different. We will, we will never make any progress with this problem on the production side. We should have learned that during prohibition. You know, we, we have a lab example. All we managed to do in those years was create the modern mafia. What we've managed to do with drug prohibition is to create the cartels and uh, gangs and, you know, things in American cities. So I don't have the specific answers, but I think we need to start treating this as the social health problem that it is. As opposed to the criminal problem that it isn't, and certainly not a military problem. You know, um, after cartel, and I, I took out an ad in, in your local paper uh, advocating this, and uh, I got a lot of phone calls, not from a single politician, but probably from 60 or 70 cops, including police chiefs, 
one police chief of a major American city, and I can't say what it was, called up, and pardon my language here, but he said, you know, you're just the kind of lefty liberal asshole I hate. But you might have an idea. Can we talk about it? And then he said, look, he said, 85% of the people who I check into my jail on a daily basis test positive for drugs. And I have them for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and they're wasted days. How can I make those days count? So I, and I'm going to see them again. And I said, well, how about a treatment center in your jail? And he said, well, could you help me set that up? I said, no, I am not qualified, but I can give you a phone number that people who can help you set it up. And, and they've been doing that. I think that there's a groundswell of public opinion, and we're really starting to see it over the past two or three years. It comes from the bottom up, as most things do. It comes more from state legislatures and, and, and local governments. But I think that there's an awareness of this, and we're doing more diversion programs. We're doing more education in jails. We're, we're sending people to treatment more. We have the resources. We're spending them, I think, on the wrong thing. Did that answer the question you That's asked? Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's all right with me. I, uh, um, yes, hi. I'm hi. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much. That was very interesting. I um, come at this from a little different perspective mm -hmm. in, in that uh, in the 90s, I started noticing just how many people around me were had uh, families with such uh, alcohol problems mm -hmm. and led me to uh, sort of listen to the, you know, the stories. And I had just this one friend who happened to uh, bring me to a Alcoholic Anonymous uh, meeting. And she explained at that meeting that, you know, she wanted me to know what <laughs> was going on in her life. And uh, of course, the 90s were also uh, the, the, where the wars, you know, were, and, and, and I think that that's one of the things that I don't find discussed in, in these, in these crises in the opioid. And, you know, you mentioned wounded soldiers and that, yeah. do you think that one of the reasons, and it might be kind of an unconscious, you know, sort of phen ph phenomenological where, uh, because there's so many people that have Pain, you know, return from you know '90s uh, in war veterans and in in, in, in these uh, even some of my family are served in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, uh, and and you know they have they're taking pain medication, you know, and I'm wondering whether you see the proliferation of war as as one of the chief reasons for why we have this, the, these drug, you know. This well, I. I, I did you finish your question? Oh, no, that, that I didn't mean it. to cut you off. I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry. That, no, no. that was it. Okay. It's, the, que the question is, how do you break down the the causes for such, you know, and, and it's not never discussed with the, even on these PBS programs, you yeah. know, with the with the kind of finesse that I would like to see. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's a good one, and it's a big one. It's a big one. Now, certainly returning veterans from wars make up a percentage of people with a drug problem, no question about it, either because they have physical wounds and that were being addressed with opioids and then they get physically addicted and then mentally and everything that comes with it or because of head injuries or or some sort of psychological mm -hmm, trauma mm -hmm. but you can't account for the opioid epidemic because the numbers simply don't add up there aren't enough returning veterans right quite frankly even if you started in the 90s to make up the sort of numbers that you're looking at in the opioid uh, addiction mm -hmm. Uh, for this book, you know, I spent a lot of time with treatment people and they are very close to just coming out and saying flat out, no trauma, no addiction, no trauma, no addiction, whether that's a physical trauma or emotional or psychological trauma. Uh, I'm not sure, but again, I'm not a specialist in, you know, in this field, I'm a dumb crime writer. Yeah. Tell stories. Right. But, uh, I'm not sure I'm quite ready to be there yet. Close. I also think that loneliness plays a big role in this. Mm. I think we're a lonely society. Um, I think that the more technology that we have to communicate with each other, the less we actually do it. Birds used to tweet. Now we do. 
I do it guilty as anybody else. Tweet like hell. Uh, but what we're starting to learn from, from successful treatment programs is that one of the key elements to success, when it's successful, is connection between people. And an interesting thing in New York, you know, they used to, um, if a guy tested positive for drugs or alcohol, they'd throw him out of public housing. And then some crazy genius said, well, that's not working. I'm going to try the opposite. I'm going to give these guys nice rooms to live in, whether they test positive or negative. You know what happened? So many of the homeless people, you know, are psychotic. They started taking their antipsychotic drugs. They started going to AA and NA meetings. They, they started connecting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that that's part of it. I, I think that because, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make this evening a critique of capitalist society or anything like that. I'm not that guy. But um, because we are such an acquisitive society. Addictive. Yeah, I think that we have we've left behind. You know, we're too damn busy. Yeah. To kind of connect with each other. And, and I think that has its costs. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, just to counter what you were saying. Okay. Um, for, I, I've got a couple of small things to say. But first of all, I'm incredibly grateful for your Twitter feed. Because when these crazy things happen that seem to happen used to happen every day and now it's like four times a day when these unbelievable things happen. I feel a little less lonely that you know there's okay. somebody out there uh -huh. who's tweeting and saying like, right. this is crazy as opposed to like, oh, this emperor's just running around naked. So thank you very much for your boldness in, in that, um, you know, in that respect. I also, um, I reread cartel in anticipation of this coming out and you know what you were saying about you wanted to write it about home here um the sad thing was okay absent some of the crazier violence aspects um you know a lot i feel like a lot of what you wrote about in the cartel and sort of the slow decay of institutions that kind of steady the ship We've seen this start to happen here. Um, I was here the other night to listen to a book about Belfast and the Troubles, and mm -hmm. people talk about it like it's over there. And Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I mean, it's happening. Mm -hmm. it, it, to see how far we've gone in two years, and these people are, are hundreds of years down their struggle, so... Um, I also had a question about, you know, being a crime novelist, because I've... I, I read a lot of crime novels, mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot about what they have to say socially as opposed to just, you know, who yeah. done it kind of thing. And yeah. I wonder if you ever struggle with being labeled a crime novelist. Nah. Do you think that people misunderstand what, nah. or you're like, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, look, it's where I live. You know, Mr. Springsteen said it as he said so many things. He, he didn't think he was writing about crime novelist but he but he was in a, a song called the darkness on the edge of town when he said uh tonight i'll be on that hill with everything i've got i'll be there on time and i'll pay the cost for wanting things that can only be found in the darkness on the edge of town and that's where we live as crime novelists you know someone once asked me in some session like this, you know, do you, do you think you live in a literary ghetto? <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I love my neighborhood. <laughs> any um, specific favorites, like writing now? Oh, I can't do that. You know, there's, okay. there's so many, okay. and, and I'm always afraid of leaving someone out. You know, what I will say is it, I think the genre is very strong right now. I think uh, this is immodest, but I think that some of the best writing in, in literature is happening in my little ghetto uh, by a lot of really good people. And Excellent. Leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Yep. I think I'll go here and then back to you, sir. Is, are you? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, See, I never have that problem of the mic. <laughs> I'm just going to lean down. I'd love to have that problem. <laughs> I hope this question doesn't put you in the um, concern of leaving folks out, but if somebody no. asked you um, if there were um, one to three books that you found helpful um, in 
thinking about what's happened in Mexico and mm -hmm. thinking about what's happened in the United States and thinking about what's happened with us in terms of the misalignment of priorities um, or mm -hmm. the scapegoating folks who are trying to deal with their pain. Um, or, yeah. and, or as you mentioned a bunch of times, um, race and uh, drug policies in America are obviously really bound up. And when the folks who were dying started to look more or be associated more with folks who look like most of us here, yeah. um, the approach changed. So what are uh, some books that you would uh, recommend Boy, or found helpful for yourself for those That's a topics? tough one. You know, I probably read a hundred or so books and I don't know how much journalism you know, to, to get ready for the border. I'd say any reporting by Anya Hernandez or Ian Grillo. Ian writes a lot now in the New York Times, has written several wonderful books. The late Charles Bowden uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but th yeah, again, there are, there are so many. I'm, I'm just gonna take a pass on that one, but thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, uh, following up a little bit on, on another question, you know, when there's maybe not a lot to feel hopeful for in, in the in the stories. And, you know, you mm -hmm. see this, you know, decades long progression for Art Keller and, you know, this ongoing struggle now uh, against, you know, the government, and multiple governments, any government um, is I don't know if maybe it happens in the book, but if, if not, it, then hypothetically, are there any kinds of people that that you would say he he would run into or he could run into and maybe make some kind of connection, you know, where where these these are people who, you know, who have a chance to to make a difference yeah. in in you know outside of the the typical government structures, outside of the DEA, yeah, yeah. outside of law enforcement or government, and you know what, what what kind of people are there, or maybe that's in the book. Yeah, I don't want to give it away. Yeah. Look, I yes is the answer. You know, I, I tried to do that a little in cartel. Mm -hmm. You know, we started to see some people. Look, I I'm not hopeless. I'm not pessimistic at all. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, pessimism is a choice, but it's not a good one. It's, it's a suicide pact if you follow through on the logic of it. You know, you still have to get up in the morning. You, you still have to do something. I think that it's incumbent on us to, as individuals, do whatever we can do. Usually those are smaller things. Smaller things add up. I, I will tell you this, that that having been on the road for these for cartel, the force and this book, which are heavy books, you know, let's face it, kind of issue laden books, talking to people all over the well, over the world, really. Uh, I see, a, again, a growing awareness on these issues. I've seen a sea change. And, and I think that that's going to keep building. And I don't think that that it. Yes, of course, it matters who's at the top. But uh, I, I see a groundswell of public opinion on a lot of these issues, on, on drug uh, issues, on criminal reform, on race issues. Uh, I, I will tell you, frankly, I think some of it's generational. And being a crime writer, I, I will say in the words of Tony Soprano, some people got to go. The owner wants to ask a question. I guess he gets. So, to Don, that. yeah, I'll give you an opening to talk about some of the movie projects that uh, are in the works, but also want to broaden the question out too. As somebody, you know, who's had experience with Hollywood, and now given all the ferment that's going on there with you know Netflix and Amazon yeah, competing, yeah. I mean, what's it like for somebody involved in trying to get their works um, made into into movies? How's it? How's it? changed uh, for well you. it's changed enormously in the sense that there are so many more platforms now mm -hmm. you know used to be there were five studios three networks and that was that and if you didn't sell to them you were done you know now we have so many more choices you know do we do we want to make a feature film or do we want to make something on an HBO, bless you, sir, or Showtime? Or do we take it to that next level and go Netflix or Amazon Prime? And then, you know, how long do we want it to last? Are we looking at an eight episode thing, you know, one and done? Or are we thinking, you know, no, I might want to extend the story out for five or seven seasons. So for a writer, it creates a lot of opportunity and, and a lot of variety, a lot of choices. 
which is is really a, a healthy thing, you know. Uh, I think both for the viewing public, but it's also for the writer, you know, because it, again, it used to be there were maybe four or five people in Hollywood who could, you know, make you or break you. I, I've been literally told. Someone literally said to me on the phone, by the way, the line, "You'll never work in this town again." <laughs> So what's coming up that's proving them wrong? The what? what? So you didn't just say that, really. Uh, a couple things in the pipe. Um, a book of mine called The Force. Uh, they're sort of finishing up the script of that. David Mamet did the, the first draft. And, and yeah, that was an interesting oh, experience. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Scott Frank, very famous A-list screenwriter, is doing the, the draft. And uh, uh, God, James Mangold uh, is directing it. And then uh, with these three books that we're here for tonight, uh, Power, the Dog, the Cartel, and uh, The Border, uh, I think it's being called the Cartel Trilogy. I didn't create that, but apparently it is. Uh, stay tuned. I think maybe as early as this week, you'll hear some kind of major news about that. So, yeah, yeah. It's okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a nice ghetto. It's a nice ghetto. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ignore um, you there. <laughs> no, that, that was... I'd love to hear about that. Um, first off, I want to thank you. I think I've gifted the Dawn Patrol more than any other book. Oh, thank and you. And I'd absolutely love to see that in the Gentleman's Hour on Netflix or something like that sometime. Stay tuned. We have a really exciting I, i'm not going to give it away exciting different announcement to make about boone and movies I'll be, and, and movies i'll be uh, the first to buy i i just approved it last night via text <laughs> <laughs> no i can my son doesn't my son's skeptical about this uh but um uh i'm very very excited about it. i think it's going to give some opportunities to some people who don't normally get them, and uh, I'm, I'm stoked in, to use Boone's language. Yeah. But you had a question. I, I do, I do. Yeah. Um, that's great news, though. <laughs> uh, you wrote an absolutely excellent article in Esquire a number of years ago, which on, on the drug uh, the drug war, and, and, and actually the Thank you. thing I found most interesting about that was the um, unintended consequences, right. basically the decriminalization and legalization of marijuana. Do you think that's a short term or long term thing? Do you think that, meaning, are we going to continue to see a stronger heroin problem because of chopping off half of the drug uh, revenue down to yeah. Mexico? L l let me clarify what I said in the okay. Esquire. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, no, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Here's what happened with the heroin epidemic. Okay, Three states legalized marijuana. In doing so, the, the marijuana revenues for the Mexican cartels fell by 38% within one year. Now they don't even bother to grow the stuff because it can't possibly compete in terms of transportation cost and quality. To make up that lost profit center, they looked north at, for opportunities. And what they saw was a ready-made market of opioid addicts. So I'm not saying that the legalization of marijuana caused the opioid epidemic. But what it did was it gave an opportunity for the Mexican cartels to undercut, both in terms of price and quality, the big pharmaceutical companies. Okay, So if it cost, there is no such thing, but if it cost the average addict about $30 to get high on a pill, you know, Oxy or Vike or, or those things, and that's usually three to five times a day, depending on the severity of the addiction, the Sinaloa cartel had a board meeting and said, well, we can get that addict high for 10 bucks. So that people who were who could not afford the $30 pop, and the, of course, the farther along your addiction goes, the less you can, you know, you're not probably holding a job, uh, could afford the 10 bucks or could find a way to get it. The Sinaloa cartel also improved the quality of that heroin. You know, it, it, Mexican heroin used to famously be garbage, Mexican tar, black heroin. And they went to a couple of Colombian chemists who created a product called cinnamon heroin, 
which is much more powerful than the old Mexican tar heroin. So addicts who were used to shooting up this garbage of Mexican tar would shoot up the same amount of cinnamon and, and often die. And then what happened was they, they, the Mexican cartels, introduced fentanyl and started to, to hit the, the heroin with fentanyl, which, which has caused a considerable number of deaths. It's 50 to 100 times stronger than, than heroin, pure heroin. So I wasn't saying in that article, I mean, the law of unintended consequences, you're absolutely right. It was an unintended consequence of legalizing marijuana that the Mexican cartels came in with all this heroin. But the opioid problem was already here, and that's why they came in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, a question, a little bit off topic, but you had said earlier you were trying to put off uh, talking about the book. God bless um, you. <laughs> you mentioned seven, I think, seven books before you quit your day job. Yeah. Laguna Beach, nobody there. Yeah. How, how as an author, how, how, did you, how did you get to the eighth book? How did you get to coming back to a night like this when you've been there when nobody was there? I'm just curious that process <laughs> for you. Yeah. Listen, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't lie to you. It came out on a rainy night. You know, there, there were times I wanted to quit. And there were times I thought my career was over several times. Uh, I, I was still working, consulting with law firms. I was commuting between San Juan Capistrano, California, and downtown LA uh, every, every day on a train, an hour and 10 minutes each way. And uh, I'm trying to write my next book. And I looked at it, you know, a little Mac, and I was bored. And I thought, man, if I'm bored, what does a reader feel, right? So I hit delete, and I started writing in the present tense instead of the past tense. Changed everything for me, you know? Now, it took a while for it to change for the readership and the public <laughs> and the world, but I was excited again. I was having fun again. The difference being that instead of sort of describing what's on a table, it was now that the table was flipped up and incidents were just coming at you like that. A lot more fun. And I usually stay in that voice. If I, if I go away from it, it's for a very deliberate reason. Uh, but things were still tough, you know? But I wrote that book on a train. Uh, I turned it into my then agent. He said, I'm gonna sell it to the movies before I sell it as a book. I said, you're crazy, you're not gonna sell it at all. I was writing it to amuse myself on a train. Because it's much more fun writing a book than reading a book on a train, tip. <laughs> it is. Uh, and uh, he, on a Friday afternoon, sold it to the movies, and on Monday sold it to Knopf. And literally overnight, I could become a full-time writer. It was called The Death and Life of Bobby Z. Now, Hollywood made it into a movie called Just Bobby Z. Not Just Bobby Z. called it Bobby Z. <laughs> Because apparently the death in life was too complex a concept. Uh, <laughs> if you're on some cut rate airline at midnight and you've pissed them off, they'll show you that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then later on, um, uh, again, my career was just about dead in the water. Uh, and I wrote a book called Savages that infamously or famously starts with a two-word chapter. The second word is you. First word isn't. We're all grown-ups here. I, one day, at San Diego one day, I, was, I told this story using that language and the, another very distinguished elderly woman in the front row and what appeared to be your daughter. And I said, you know, the second word was you and the first word isn't, and this woman very loudly turned to her daughter and said, it was fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so much for my efforts to be delicate and gentlemanly. But you know, that book, um, that was a big chance. It was a big change in style, a big change in voice, very radical book in content and style. And uh, I was uh, in England and knowing the review was gonna come out and I knew that uh, if the review wasn't great, my career was over. And uh, five in the morning, 
in Heathrow Airport with my wife and my son calls my wife's number. And I, my son's here, that's why I'm pointing, it's him. <laughs> He's much younger then and a uh, teenager. And I hear my wife, she turned a little pale. And I hear her say, oh, you'd better tell that to your father yourself. <laughs> Thomas, I was scared. I, you know, what could that news be, right? 5.30 in the morning, Heathrow Airport. And uh, I was flying to Milan to, to do a presentation. And uh, I get on the phone and, uh, and you know, Thomas says, um, Dad, have you seen the New York Times this morning? And I say, no, Thomas, it's 5.30 in the morning in England. And he must have heard, you must have heard the terror in my voice, right? And he said, no, 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 it's a rave. And Janet Maslin wrote this incredibly kind and fulsome review of that book, and that saved my career. So there have been a number of times, you know. The other sort of weird part of that story is I get to Milan and the flight was late. I'm supposed to give a speech that night, a very dweebish talk about how the Godfather is really a retelling of Shakespeare's Henry IV, which a lot of people wanted to hear. And uh, they want to do a sound check, right? Like we, we get into the, the parking lot of this hotel, and they whip my wife and they send her to up to her room and they say, you've got to get this band to a sound check. Sound check, you know, I'm not the E Street band. I'm the, they shoved me into this van, very excited Italian thing going on. As a, again, this is a theme tonight. Another very distinguished elderly woman sitting on the bench across from me, and it's Joyce Carol Oates. Ooh. Ooh. And I was, you know, instantly intimidated. And, uh, and I said, Hello, Ms. Oates. Uh, my name's Don Winslow. And, she looks up from the New York Times and says, oh, you got that wonderful review this morning. So that's the story. Yes, sir. OK, uh, we'll make this the last question. Sure. OK. Uh, have you thought He's about- afraid I'll keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about uh, what you want to write about next? I've written it. Can you tell us no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Thank you for asking. I, I uh, will define it negatively. Uh, it's not about drugs. I, I really am done with that world. I, I need to move on in terms of substance and style again and, you know, kind of change a little bit and grow, I guess, is the cliche word. Uh, but I, I have finished it. I think I finished it. I mean, I, I set it down to come out on, on tour now, on the road now. Uh, and that gives me, you know, a few weeks to let it sit and I'll go back and see if I think it's any good or not. Uh, and then start thinking about the reader and doing later drafts and things. So, yeah. Well, I think that is the last question. This gentleman's dying to applaud. I'm dying to let you. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful. So copies, copies of Don.